particularly like her, though. <laughs> Just, uh, I know you don't all know our family. Uh, that's my wife. We've been married come September for 20 years. <laughs> Super grateful. Again, definitely want to welcome everyone into our community. Um, we're a group of people that really seek to serve God and, and love God and live out what we see in the scriptures. If you're visiting for the first time, I'm going to try to take the mic so I can stay on it and not get in trouble with everybody that's in charge of that stuff. Um, if you're visiting for the first time, we really are thankful that you can come and join us for church. Um, we do want you to know that we are a community that strives to live out the scriptures, but we recognize that we're flawed. We're just regular people trying to make sense of what we see in the scriptures. Um, right now in our world, there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of challenge, and there's a lot of strain. And our response to that is to turn our face towards God and also to turn our efforts towards engaging directly in the community. Because that's what we see that Jesus did, and that's what we believe Jesus calls us to do. So as a congregation, we really... I consistently talk about three big themes. We talk about the importance of gathering. So we gather like this on Sundays, and uh, we gather to worship God, we gather to have communion. I will say Jason did an incredible job with this communion. It's awesome. He took us from Corinthians to Revelation to Revelation to Revelation. That was deep, man. And he's been in these, he's been living in the book of Revelation. So I was really inspired to see how you brought everything uh, into focus for us. I really appreciate how God used Tom to talk to us about our giving. And as Tom had mentioned, uh, we are in the process right now of developing a strategic plan as a church uh, that the board initiated, that our elders have uh, been an active part of, and that our staff is involved in uh, beginning a framework for us to talk as a community. But just so you know how we do things, we're going to do this thing together. So this isn't like the board's plan. The board creates framework. The elders make sure that we're staying on track. The ecclesiastical leadership, myself included, we make sure that we're being biblically centered. And then we talk about it as a community so that we can really walk in step with God. But we gather to be able to live out the scriptures. We believe it's important as Christians that we serve that we actually practice our faith in a daily way and in a practical way. And we believe that leads to us multiplying disciples of Jesus. Uh, last week, we had a conversation on the theme of multiply, and we ended our conversation right here uh, in the book of 2 Timothy. So I want to invite you to turn back to 2 Timothy for us to continue our conversation. We promised that we would, and some of y'all took notes, and you're like, are you going to go back there, or are we going to go somewhere else? We're going to go right back there to 2 Timothy. Let's go. And I'm going to follow my wife's instructions and wear my glasses so I don't cost us more money 20 years from now. 2 <laughs> Corinthians. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 2. Let's go to God in the word of prayer before we read the Bible. Our God, Father, please open up our minds and our hearts to understand the scriptures. God, some of us, our hearts are light, and we feel free and alive, and others of us, our hearts are heavy. We're heavy with the weight of our own challenges. We're heavy with the weight of the things that are going on around us. We're heavy with the weight of the pain that we see going on in the world, God. God, I pray that wherever we are, heavy or light or in between, that God, you would give us a faith that would enable us to be what you want us to be in this world. Some of us have already made the decision to make Jesus the Lord of our life. God, help us, God, to live out that faith. Some of us have wondered and we're struggling and we need to be restored and recentered in our faith. Others of us are unsure about what we believe. And I pray, God, that wherever we find ourselves, that we would hear from you today. Not hear from people, but we would hear from you. And that every aspect of this service would bring you glory and would draw your people closer and closer to you. Help us as we read the Bible now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
So last week we talked about multiplying disciples. Paul was all about the mission of living out Jesus' call to multiply disciples. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is talking to Timothy, uh, a young minister that he's trained in the ministry and instructed to go and lead churches in different places. And who he's instructed specifically at this time to address the needs for the sister congregation in Ephesus. And in chapter 2, Paul says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Really important to be strong in grace. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And your hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, uh, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer will be the first to receive a share of the crop. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And last week we talked about the fact that God is calling us and that we really wanted to spend the last seven days or the last six days reflecting on what this passage is talking about. This passage outlines uh, three distinct character traits. One of a soldier who is serving the commanding officer. And as has been stated, but if you're visiting for the first time, just want to let you know, I am not the commanding officer. I am a press secretary. I deliver the news. Don't be mad with the mailman. You don't yeah. yell at the mailman, what's up with this bill? And you also don't say, thank you for bringing my check. Well, you could. You, you can be nice to the mailman. Please don't fight the mailman. The mailman is just doing his job. The commanding officer, the commanding officer for all of us is Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus, those of us that said Jesus is Lord, we are called to be soldiers of Christ. Now one of the things that's problematic is sometimes in churches, people have very limited views of what God's called us to be. So some of you, when I said soldier, you're like, yes. The 60% of our congregation are active retired military. You're like, clear command structure, we know what we're doing, M military formation, you love being a soldier. And that's awesome. We need to be all, we all need to be soldiers. We need to be the army of God. But we're not just the army of God. We're also called to be athletes. We're called to train ourselves to be godly. We're called to follow the rules, follow the standards of God from His Word. This is not subjective. This is not what I want or what you want. This is what God wants. So we've got to run the race as God has outlined it. Just to be clear, everybody has their own race. Don't be mad at someone if you feel like they're not moving fast enough. They're running their race. Right. If you can run super fast, God bless you. We're glad you're doing your thing. But it's got one. It's God D. He can run fast. He's always number one. Sorry, this is an inside joke. I probably should have done it at church. Now I gotta explain that to the elders. I'm sorry. Sorry, God. So you've got to be an athlete. You've got to wake up early. You've got to train hard. This is your faith. This is our faith together. Christianity, by the way, is a team sport. You don't get to just do this by yourself. But you do need to do your part. But God also calls us to be farmers. He calls us to sow the seed. He calls us to bring in the harvest. He calls us to be what He's called us to be, and He wants us to be about the active work of multiplying disciples, of making disciples of Jesus. Last week we talked about what kind of disciples are we making. Now in Jesus' strategic plan that He lays out from the Scriptures from beginning to end, He actually shows us how to develop the right kind of disciples and how to be developed into the right kind of disciples, which is going to lead us to what we're going to talk about today. Amen? Yeah. So we gather together. This is what Jesus did. He spent time. They served people. And they multiplied. Let's go backward, because we began at the end in mind last week of talking about multiply. 
let's spend today really talking about what it means as Christians to serve and why Jesus wants us to do this. Turn over to Matthew chapter 25. So Matthew 25 is an amazing and really essential passage of Scripture. Now, for those of you that love big theological terms, I'm going to hit you with a term. Hermeneutics. <laughs> it just means how to interpret something. So this passage, Matthew 25, and specifically Matthew 25, 31 through 46, is the hermeneutical key or the interpretive key or the Rosetta Stone to understanding the book of Matthew. If you want to understand Matthew, you just need to read this and get it and everything else will make sense. You see, the case that Matthew, Jesus' disciple, was making was that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And that Jesus Christ came not simply to call people to have the right understanding or the right doctrine, but the right life. See, the thing that God's interested in is not you knowing big theological words or you having a, a big bank of scriptures that you can memorize and that you can regurgitate. He's interested in you doing it. That's right. So this scripture helps us to understand what Jesus is really after in the book of Matthew and a big part of understanding what Jesus is really after, period. Amen? Amen. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory, in heavenly glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him. And He'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom created for you, I prepare for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. Yeah. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, I just want to be clear. When did we see you hungry and feed you? I don't remember feeding Jesus. Or thirsty and give you something to drink. When did we see you a stranger? and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, and go to visit you? Verse 40, the king, the commanding officer, the chief shepherd, he who was, who is, and he who will return, the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. <coughs> Here's the challenge. You can talk about God all day long. What's really interesting is in our country, in our county, in our communities, people on both sides of every issue talk about God. And they use God as the basis for their argument. So often. And so that use of religion as a basis for our arguments is a big part of the foundation of our country and the idea behind the fact that we should separate religion from anything that has to do with public life. Right. But Christians actually live in the public. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can't separate ourselves. We can't say, well, you know, our church doesn't have those problems, so man, it's really bad. I see it on the news. Hope it works out for you. You can't say, well, my family's well fed. Man, it's really sad that people are hungry. I'll pray for them. Jesus doesn't say, you prayed for me. Jesus said, you fed me. Amen. Jesus didn't say, you sent me well wishes. Jesus said, you invited me in. Yeah. There's some practical ramifications to being a Christian. They're incredibly uncomfortable. Amen. Yeah. But you have to model a healthy community. Right. So a big part of what this passage is teaching us is that in order to form the right kinds of Christians, it is important that those Christians 
begin their journey by loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Matthew 22. Right. But it is also important that those Christians understand that they have an obligation to be involved in the world in the here and now. Right. There is no question that our mission is, as Jason outlined, we want people to spend eternity with God. That is the end result. That's what we talked about last week. But we can't divorce ourselves from today's realities. Yeah. We've got to be involved. Well, what does that look like? Now, here's another really cool phrase. Orthodoxy versus orthopraxy. So sound teaching versus sound living. So just so you know, if you're visiting our church for the first time, our church is a part of the restoration movement. So we got our church finds its roots in the 1800s and this call to go back to the Bible. We love to study the Bible. After church is over, someone invariably is going to invite you to their home because we love to eat. We keep trying to live out the eating scriptures. We're like, I see in Acts 2, we should eat. So we'll go we'll out to eat. And not long after that, someone will say, hey, would you like to do a Bible study? Because we love to study the Bible. It's what we do. If you go to our website, there's like Bible study series. Do you know how hard it is to not flood our website with Bible studies? It's like what we love to do. Like we love orthodoxy. We love teaching the Bible. But you can teach something and not live it. See, Jesus is interested in us doing both. Teaching what is right, but living what we teach. So if you're visiting today or if you're part of our congregation, here's what we teach. We have to live out what we believe in the scriptures. Turn over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 61. Jesus came. He defined his ministry this way. Are you okay if we do a little bit of teaching today? There's some orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, orthopraxy. <laughs> Those are great words. We've got to make sure we live them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love history. And I'm particularly drawn to people at pivotal times in history that step up and do amazing things. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that I'm just blown away by is George Washington. Blown away by his resolve to do what's right, no matter what. And his resolve to know when to step away and when to step up. I do genuinely believe that we are at a pivotal time in the church's history. Potomac Valley Church's history. I do believe we're at a pivotal time in our family of church's history. And I believe we're at a pivotal time in America's history. The question is, what kind of person are you going to be in this time? Jesus shows us what kind of person he was and what kind of person he's calling us to be. Come on, Will. Talk Isaiah 61. I'm with you, Chris. I'm coming. I promise. Come on, Chris. Like, Come on, Will. Let's go. I'm coming, Chris. I'm coming. Have, have you ever been hugged by Chris? <laughs> I'm good, Chris. I am Bay, press secretary doing the job. <laughs> the spirit of the sovereign Lord, Jesus says, is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives. And release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Here's what they will be like. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. This is your calling. You are a disciple of Jesus. They will restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. But here's the problematic part for the Jewish audience and 
dare I say, for us today, aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And they will inherit a double portion in the land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. Brothers and sisters, friends, when Jesus was called upon in his community to define his ministry, he took the scroll of Isaiah the prophet, as our brother Luke records in the book of Luke, and he ran the scroll all the way to Isaiah 61, and he read the scripture. This is what we're called to do. We're called to serve. We are called to engage. Look, you cannot, you can't get around this part. You cannot in one hand hold Christ and prejudice. You can't have both and stand before the king and him welcome you in. And just to be clear, prejudice does not is not localized to people that are black or white or Latino. Prejudice is a human condition. You cannot have a predetermined view of who people are and be right before God. You've got to change. And in this place that we're gathered, look at the beautiful diversity that we have. It's such a blessing from God. And we need to live that out and celebrate that in this place. But it is not enough that we have it here for ourselves. We have to go and give it to others. But there's a way that you can go about sharing this. You can share it with missionary zeal. With a sense that you're better than others. Right, right. Mm. Or you can get down on your knees and you can serve your community. Right. Yeah. Just so you know, the latter was the option that Jesus chose. Yeah. Just so you know, the latter was the option that we chose and we shamed the Romans 2,000 years ago. Yeah. And we will shame America again. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. We will shame America by serving her. We will serve those who divide. We will serve those who seek to unite. We will serve the rich. We will serve the poor. We will serve those who share our faith convictions. We will serve those who do not share our faith convictions. We don't serve for what we can get. We serve because of who we are. When you serve this way, you become a different type of person. You become a person driven by the motivations of God in the spirit of Jesus. That's what God is calling us to do. Yeah. Right. And we're not talking about it hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Legitimately, the people are outside the doors right now waiting for you to sign you up to serve. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to actually do it. Yeah. We're going to need everybody on deck starting this Sunday. If you came to visit, this was a unique Sunday for you to visit. Because we're going to ask you to serve. And we, we're going to ask you to serve without asking you what you believe. Right. Just so you know, that's not something that we do. We vet people here. <laughs> like, oh, 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 I see you with that communion tray. Not sure if you're qualified to hold it. Yeah. Can we talk? Yeah. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Now, just so you know, with the children, we're going to vet you hard. So, I don't know. Not everybody gets to serve the children. But anybody can serve in the parking lot. Yeah. Anybody can serve and welcome people in. And anyone can help pack a grocery bag so someone has food to eat. We can all work together to do this. And why are we going to do that? Because of what we believe. We want to encourage you today to sign up to serve. You know, we're intentionally having the service in recognition of the incredible heroism that happened many years ago on September the 11th, on October the 8th, to honor all of our first responders. It breaks my heart, and I know it breaks yours too, to see so many people get plowed down when they go to places like Walmart or to a concert. 
and to see the incredible devastation that's happening because of the darkness that's growing in the world right. and the evil that is present in the world. And you can get mad about that. You can yell at your TV about that. You can do a whole bunch. You can yell on the internet about that. You can get on Twitter and tweet. You can get on Facebook and Facebook. I don't know what you call what you do on Facebook. <laughs> comment. That should have another name. That doesn't sound like a comment. Confrontational comment. You can like, unlike. You can do all sorts of stuff. Or we can invite our policemen. Invite our firemen. Invite the EMTs and pray for them and honor them and thank them for what they do to serve our communities. And we're not doing that because it's a political stunt. It is a big key political stunt. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. He is the one that we follow. So yes, it is big P. It's not partisan. It is Christian to honor these guys. Does that put us on the side of law enforcement? Sure. But not just the side of law enforcement. We're also on the side of those who are abused by law enforcement. But how do you reconcile the two unless you bring them in one room together? We will fight for everyone on every single level because of what we believe. Yeah. Not because of what's going on in the world, but because of how we should respond to what's going on in the world. We're fired up. We get to partner with ACTS. We're going to get to serve the IWAP. We're grateful we get to work alongside them. We're grateful for the work they do. There's no way as a church that we can do the things that they're doing. Right. They're able to provide food where we can't provide food. And we're not going to do FUBU. You know how churches be doing, right? Y'all know about FUBU? No. <laughs> Y'all thought I was talking about clothes. <laughs> FUBU is for us, by us. Yep. We will only support things that we do ourselves so that we can control what we're doing. We're not trying to control anything. We're trying to help anyone that's doing good work. And acts, they do good work. They've been doing it for 50 years. So we're gonna support them. But you know what? We're gonna need volunteers to do that. Don Lombardo has the biggest task he's taken on so far. And God bless Don Lombardo. His hair is still black. We'll see how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> he's not especially happy with me right now. But we're still friends. You gotta love your enemies, bro. <laughs> I'm not your enemy. I know. You know, you know. I'm kidding. We really need to support Don, though. It's gonna take a Herculean effort for us to do this. Why are we doing this? Because we love Jesus. Because we love Jesus. <laughs> when we do this event, it's not an event just for Christians, by the way. The mosque will be there. And we'll support them. Mm -hmm. We don't share their faith position, but we share their concern for the poor. There'll be people that have no faith whatsoever, and we'll support them. Why? Because that's who we are. Right. We don't change who we are, but we serve everyone. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, this is going to change who we are, because it's going to call us to be more like Jesus. I'm excited we get to have this 30th anniversary service. Yeah. This week, everything changed. The plan originally was this service was going to be in D.C., but God shifted it, so this service is right here in Woodbridge. I'm so excited. We get to serve our brothers and sisters from all over in our sister congregations in Baltimore, in, in D.C., in Montgomery County, our sister congregations in Frederick, Maryland, all the way from Delaware, people are driving to be here with us. We have to be prepared to serve. This morning as we gather, I want to invite you to turn back over to Matthew chapter 25. Oh, well. This is changing us, guys. Because gone are the days that we can circle our wagons and dismiss what's going on in the world. And make no mistake about it, we will get bloodied in the process. We will. You want to follow Jesus?
Jesus and not die? Wait, let's go. It doesn't work. You want to follow Jesus and it be comfortable? It doesn't work. You want to follow Jesus and only love those who love you? It doesn't work. If you do that, you will be defined by the king in a way that you and I don't want to be defined. Right. Now, I personally like goats. I grew up raising goats. And uh, my, my dad's Jamaican, so I spent a good portion of my life in the country, in Jamaica, raising goats. I particularly like this passage of scripture because of goats. <laughs> Jesus' position on goats and mine are aligned. If you've ever raised goats, you understand what I'm talking about. Sheep might be not so smart, but they're amenable. Yeah. Goats are not amenable. Goats are stubborn and obstinate. Goats are difficult. I remember once, not once, many times I've gone, and goats, you can't put goats in a pen unless it's a strong pen, like a pen that like John Hewitt built. Like, it's got to be like an iron pen, because they break out, they do all sorts of, they, they, they butt, they do all sorts of crazy stuff. So we tied our goats up, and our goat was so difficult, many of them did this, they broke the rope, they'd run away, they'd get in a, in, in, in a thicket, or in Jamaica they call it maca, so they get in the middle of maca, like all this, you know, all these thorns, and you'd get your machete, and you'd clear through, and you save your goat, and your goat's crying out, mad, mad. And you go and you save your goat, and as soon as you save your goat, you would think you have this wonderful emotional connection with your goat. Your goat's like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> So when I read this passage, I think about that goat. That Jesus says, he turns to those on the left. He says, depart from me. You were cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Theological point. God's intent is not that anyone will be separated from him for eternity. Satan and the angels made a choice to separate themselves from God and seal their fate. And made a choice that they would separate themselves from God. Satan is actively working in our world to get people to join his rebellion and to abolish humanity. Last week we talked about C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man. Here's what I believe is happening in the world. Can we talk for a second? Yeah. Our world is getting more and more desensitized. People are making the argument that we're nothing more than animals that are influenced based on the chemicals in our body. Now, just to be clear, I do not reject science. The chemicals are real. When I work out, I definitely feel that runner, you know, the runner's high. Me and all the guys in the running club, all about that. Not questioning the science, but we are more than just chemicals. And we are more than just animals. We have a soul. But if you believe that we are just chemicals and we are just animals and we have no soul, then you can easily make the next jump to abolish any sense of humanity. See, it is right that you should cry when people die. It is right that you should have outrage at children separated from their parents. Whatever the legal matters that are involved, you should have outrage about that. It is right that you should feel broken that 7% of the people in this incredibly rich county don't even have enough food. And just so you know, those stats only get more challenging the further south you go. And those stats are staggering in Fredericksburg. They're staggering in Spotsylvania. Because in rural communities, people have even greater difficulties connecting with services. That's just a reality. And people are even more siloed off in many ways. That should bother you. But let's just be clear. God's intent was never that anyone would be separated from him. But Satan's intent is to recruit people to embrace his ideology, to not care about what's going on in the world, to say that's someone else's problem. They don't look like me. They don't pray like me. Why should I care about them? We care about everyone because we're Christians. That's just what we do. For 
For I was hungry. You gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. I was a foreigner. And you did not invite me in. I needed clothes. And you did not clothe me. I was sick. Or in prison. And you did not look after. They also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And the king, he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did do for the least of these brothers of mine, you did not do for me. I'm glad you came to church. The songs were amazing. This part of the story might be really challenging for you. I just want to be clear. We're not pointing any fingers at you. We're recognizing that we're all responsible. This is not somebody else's country. This is our country. This is not somebody else's county. This is our county. These are not somebody else's kids. These are our kids. This is not somebody else's family. These are our families. We're all in this together. And Jesus says that we need to serve. If you serve, you will develop the heart of God. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, the first decade that I spent in the ministry, my focus was on seeing the church grow. That's all I focused on, just to be completely honest. And then I got the opportunity to go to Indonesia for the first time, right after Journey was born, and sit in an orphanage in a foreign country and look at children who had no parents. And then I went to a slum area and then I came back to the U.S. and I, I looked at what's going on in our communities and I realized that what's going on here is as devastating as what's going on there. Yeah. And there's no way for me or you, for us to be Christians without being concerned and without being actively involved in making change. Not just for after, but in the here and now. My brothers and sisters, my friends and neighbors, we need to gather. We need to serve. And I pray that in that process, we will multiply true disciples of Jesus. Please let me pray for you. Our God and Father, we don't begin to know how to face what's going on. But we march into this world with your beat within our hearts. We want to be like Jesus. When we see hungry people, we pray that you'll provide the food for us to feed thousands. But if it's just the food to feed one, we pray to take that opportunity. When we see people that are strangers, we pray to invite them in. And we know that that's a, there's a risk to that level of engagement. But we do it still because you were willing to invite us in. Even though it cost you your son's life. You're willing to sacrifice everything so that we could come to know you. God, we look at our neighbors with our clothes we want to sacrifice, and we not only want to talk about what that looks like, but we pray to actively be involved in this. Bless our efforts with the Iowa. Bless our efforts as we go forward into this fall. Please be with the kids that are about to start school. Please protect them. Please protect our schools. Please protect our places of worship. Please protect our public places where we go to shop. Please be with us. But help us as Christians never to walk into any environment with fear because we know that a dangerous place with you is safe. And even places we consider to be safe without you are dangerous. So we walk with your theme in our hearts. We march into this world as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus. And God, may your disciples multiply in number so we can change the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.